Hello, my name is Tom Hooker, and I'm the pastor here at Summit United Methodist Church. And on behalf of um, the worship servants who are here with me this morning, uh, Rhonda Berlin, our music director, and Reverend Connie Hooker, our assistant pastor, as well as our uh, technology crew of Lori Costello and uh, Mandy Berlin, we welcome you. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, we're just so glad that you are joining us. And for those of you who are here in person, just welcome and, and um, we're just thrilled to, to be worshiping together as a community. Today we're going to be continuing our series entitled Called to Be Church, and we're go going to be talking about decision making in the church and practicing a preference for God. We greet you in the name of Christ. It is a joy to be together as a community of faith. We come together to worship, to pray, to grow in discipleship, and to serve. Thankfully, we can do so in this congregation. Let us then worship together as God's grateful people. Let us join together in our centering prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, source of all understanding, wisdom, and knowledge, we ask for discerning hearts and minds. May we come to know your ways and your plans for our lives and the life of this congregation. May we fully trust in you and walk boldly in the path you have set before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is now time for our children's message. And so if you are watching online, I call the children's attention to this message. And we do have a few children here this morning in person. So uh, this is for you. But this is really for children of all ages. So let me ask you something. Do you ever have a tough time making decisions, making choices? I do. You know, so for example, it's snack time. What kind of snack am I going to have? Well, some of that depends on what kind of snack I'm allowed to have, right? But 
Should I have chips or a banana, piece of fruit? Which would you choose? Did you choose the chips or the banana? Probably the chips, okay. Let me make it even a little bit easier, maybe. Would you choose a piece of chocolate or the banana? Chocolate. Yeah, even the big kids would choose the chocolate. Okay. All choices. But, of course, the healthier choice is the banana, right? Or how about when, um, let's say, I need, I can go out and play. I can go out and play baseball. Or I can do homework. Or study. Which one should I do? Well, it might be more fun to go out and play with my friends, right? But I have homework due tomorrow. Oh, but I want to go out and play with my friends. But I've got to finish that homework. Which one do I choose? Okay. But maybe you don't like baseball, so homework's okay. But do I play baseball or do I go out and ride my bike? Which one am I going to do? Now, I love to ride my bike. Ooh, it's very tempting to choose this one. Overdoing my homework. Which one would you choose? Now, these are all choices that we have to make every day. But they're, yeah, and they're somewhat important. But, you know, there are some really bigger choices that sometimes have to be made. We adults know that we have to make choices. Sometimes you have to make choices on the things that you, you need to buy, like a car or a house. Or you need to make choices on how to invest your money. Or you need to make choices on um, where to travel to, where to go on vacation. All important choices. But, you know, in the church, we need to make some choices, too. We need to make some choices in the church, and we need to make some decisions on what we are, go we are going to do as a church. And sometimes we like to choose things that are according to our way. My way. Your way. This is what we choose because we want it to be the way that we want it to be. And so oftentimes when we're thinking about things and make, trying to make a choice, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do, what I think is the right thing to do. But when we read the Bible and we learn the teachings of Jesus and Jesus wants us to do things God's way, and God's way may not, sometimes it is the same as our way, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the opposite. So we need to choose. Are we going to follow our way or are we going to follow God's way? It's really easy to follow our way, but sometimes it's difficult to follow God's way. And sometimes it's difficult to know what God's way is. So, I have here an arrow. An arrow is pointing to our way. But Jesus told us, told the early church that he would send someone called the Holy Spirit. He would send the Holy Spirit to help us, to help us to make decisions. And so, if this is us, this is you and me, pretend that that's what this vase is. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, look where the arrow is pointing. Now, I know it's, it's, this is going to be difficult for those of you who are sitting on the outsides to see. So you might want to move in to, towards the center end of the aisle. You see that the arrow is pointing to my way. But watch what happens when... This is water, but this is the Holy Spirit. 
So, watch what happens when I get filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you see what happened to the arrow? Where is the arrow pointing now? It's pointing to God's way because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus teaches us. And how can we do that? We pray, we worship together, we talk about God, and then we sense that God is present in our lives and in the life of the congregation. So that's why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for <clears throat> your spirit that is always upon us. But sometimes we try to, we admit, we try to ignore it. And so our prayer is that we might indeed be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we might continually pray, and that we might continually worship, and that we might continually study your Bible so that we might be filled with that spirit that might lead us to making the right decisions according to your ways. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the, the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and chapter 5, verse 42 to 6, verse 7. Listen for the word of the Lord for you today. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at homes and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to preach and teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Now during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the holy community, the whole community of the disciples, and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. 
Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said was pleasing, pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on him, on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. You know, sometimes when you are working at your job or doing a certain task, whether it's at work or at home, it seems like the harder you try and the more you work at it, the more difficult it becomes. And then at other times, it just seems to come together so effortlessly. It's almost like you're on autopilot and they say, you're in the zone. I know it happens to me sometimes. I'll be working on a sermon or preparing for a, uh, to teach a class or to lead a class or a Bible study or even doing some administrative tasks. And it seems like the harder I work at it, the more research I do, and the more I think about it, the more difficult it becomes, and it just doesn't come together for me. And I can't figure it out. And then at other times, the thoughts and the reflections just seem to flow right out of my head and onto paper, and it just seems like magic almost. I'm in the zone. So people, no matter what profession they're in, are, are often in the zone. My guess is that Rhonda is in the zone many times, that the music just flows effort, effortlessly out of her. Joe Musgrove is a baseball pitcher. And for the last three years, he pitched for the Pittsburgh Pirates Baseball Club. But in January of this year, he was traded to the San Diego Padres Baseball Club. And on Friday, April 9th, he pitched a gem of a game. He pitched a no-hitter, the first in San Diego history. For nine innings, no one was able to get a hit off of him. He was in the zone. And you know, there's this unwritten rule in baseball when a pitcher gets close to completing a no-hitter, Everyone leaves him alone. No one talks to him. They stay away from him because you don't want to rattle him. You don't want to get him out of the zone. In many professions, people are in the zone, and it seems like the work just flows effortlessly out of them. However, it took a lot of hard work, a lot of practice leading up to that and probably quite a few failures as well to get to that point. When you're in the spiritual zone, you're empowered by God's spirit to do God's work. And it seems to come so easy. It seems to just flow out of you, just like any other zone. And it moves you even closer to God. You're feeling God's power within you. I imagine that's how the first century church, as described in the book of Acts, how they were functioning. I think they were in the spiritual zone. I think things just started to happen for them. And, and the church started to grow. And 
everything seemed to be working. It was as if they were in, they have found their sweet spot. And it happened by a lot of prayer, a lot of worship, by practicing the fundamentals of the Christian life, by serving together, and by supporting one another. And then they began to grow as a church. But that growth created some new challenges for them. It required a change. It required them to reevaluate reevaluate how they needed to better equip themselves to continue to be the church. And so these were new challenges, new opportunities, and it required some decisions to be made. Many people were traveling, many Jewish people were traveling to Jerusalem, and among them were widows, poor widows, who were often cared for by, by the people in the synagogue. But now these widows had, had converted to being followers of the way, followers of the way of Christ. And so now the responsibility fell upon the church to care for them. But it seemed to some that they were being neglected. Needs weren't being met because there was too much to do. And like was the case for Moses, as he was leading the people in the wilderness, when there was so much to do, his father-in-law Jethro gave him some advice. He said, Moses, you need to delegate to be able to accomplish things. And so that was the case for this early church. Some delegation needed to take place. The apostles needed to be able to delegate. So how did this early church respond? How did this early community of faith respond? Did they blame, <clears throat> excuse me, did they blame others? Did they blame each other? Did they point fingers? Did they become defensive when they were called out? Did they ignore the problem and walk away? No, that is not the case at all. They didn't do any of those things. Instead, they faced the issue head on. They faced the challenge. And they looked for ways to resolve it. Together, as a community of faith. You know, so often we evaluate our church experiences based on <clears throat> our own needs. Does it meet my needs? Okay. But the early church didn't have that option. They didn't have the option to walk away if it didn't meet their needs because there was no other church or denomination down the road. So they had to face the challenges and new opportunities head on and deal with them. So how did they deal with it then? Well, it revolved around, around the community. They did it together. And together they became aware of this missed opportunity. So what did they do? They listened. The first thing they did is they listened. They listened to each other and they listened to God to find that new direction together as a community. I'm sure they did as individuals as well, but then they did it together as a community. And then, only then, did they begin to respond with action. So, in ministry, how do we deal with new opportunities in God-honoring ways? We deal with it the same way that the first century church did. We listen. And then we respond. No matter whether we're growing or whether we're declining or if we're stagnant as a church. We need to learn to adapt and we need to face the challenges that lay before us. So we need to what we call discernment. We need to figure out where we are being called. And that begins... That listening begins by practicing a preference for God. 
Practicing a preference for God puts God first, puts God as a priority in one's life, and therefore places God as a priority in the community's life as well, which is not always the case. Practicing a preference for God means being very intentional and being fervent in our prayer life, in our time of meditation and reflection, individually and together. It means being very intentional about our worship practices and worshiping together and being attentive to what worship is really all about. It's about God, not about us. Be, practicing a preference for God means we open our hearts and our minds to God's ways, even if they are different than our ways. We allow ourselves, as we discussed with the children, to be filled with the Spirit, and that comes through that prayer and that worship life. And that means letting go of some of our own desires and trusting God. And I can tell you from experience, and you can probably tell me from experience too, our ways don't always align with God way, God's ways. Sometimes they do. But sometimes we have to make that difficult choice to not do what we would like to do, but to go in the direction that God is calling us. And that becomes easier when we practice that preference for God, when we place God first, when we are intentional about our prayer life, our worship life, our devotional or meditational life. Do you want to know God's will more than anything else? Do you want to be able to know God's will for yourself, for the congregation? then we need to listen. We need to practice the disciplines, prayer, worship, study. And when we do those things, they increase our desire to be one with God, to be in alignment with God. And that's what this is about. When we practice that preference, we place ourselves in God's hands and we offer ourselves to God. I remind this is a good opportunity to remind you about the cards that we handed out last week that I ask you to take some time during the week and reflect upon how you want to offer yourself to God, what you will do with the community to make disciples and transform the world. And if you didn't bring your card, there are plenty of extra cards um, on the um, <clears throat> offering table and there's a basket there to ladies there are several cards in there already and so i just encourage you to to uh, write these they are anonymous and if you're watching online you can use our church app and use the the prayer portal for, for from that to write your offering and that will be anonymous as well or you can send me an email and of course that won't be anonymous but it will only be known by me. And what I'd like to do is make a list of the, the ways in which we are all offering ourselves to God and see how we can then work together to make those things happen. So I encourage you, if you haven't done it already, to do so. Um, there are cards in the back, and uh, if you want to take it home and bring it back next week, I'll give you until next week to do that as well. When we practice a preference for God, then we are able to receive God and we are able to respond in alignment with God. You know, one of the things that disciples did is they, when they listened to the, the concern, they framed the problem. They tried to get to the root of the problem. The problem wasn't up just about food distribution. Yes, that was an issue. 
but it was more than that. It was about the growth of the community and how they were going to handle a growing community. So if we want to get to the root of the problem, why the church is in decline, we need to listen more carefully to God and who we are, we are called to be. Author and theologian Brian McLaren in his um, book, the, Spirit, the Great Spiritual Migration, uh, believes that people want a church that is true to its founder, that has a vision of its founder and follows the vision of its founder, of course. And he said that's true of any religion. But in our case, in Christianity, true of Jesus Christ, of course. He says, and when we discover that, or when we rediscover it, then it helps us to move closer to God. We can express our belief, in, our true belief in God. We live like we believe in God. Author and theologian Dallas Willard uses a great illustration that I just heard this week, and I love this. So if there's a chair over there, do you believe that that's a chair? How much do you believe that that's a chair? You believe enough to sit on it that that's a chair. Do you believe in Jesus Christ and his mission, his vision? How much do you believe that? Do you believe it enough to follow it? and to practice that preference for God. And when we do that, we might, when we migrate to that vision of Jesus Christ, then we move away from blaming other factors, whether it's culture or whether it's other people. And we move to the core, to the center of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So, in this current world, in the 21st century, in, in the midst of a pandemic, and in a post-pandemic culture, we face many challenges as a church. There's no question about that. And so, if we are going to rediscover and reevaluate who we are, the first thing we need to do is listen. We need to listen to God, God's promptings. We need to listen to each other. We need to be fervent about our prayer life and practice that preference for God. And then we will discover where God is leading us. One of the things I noticed about the apostles that after the decision was made, what did they do? They laid hands on the people they selected and prayed over them, asking God's blessings and God's provisions for them and their ministry. And the result was a continued growth of the church. So I pray, I commit to praying for the leadership of this church and for the congregation as a whole for you and its ministries. For you to be able to listen and to hear God speaking to you as a congregation where God is leading us. And to pray for God's blessing on how we proceed to follow God's direction. I pray that you will do likewise. Amen. Let us pray together. Almighty and ever loving God, hallelujah, praise you, Lord. We are so glad to be together in your presence to worship you. Your love for us is so great, and we thank you for your love and forgiveness. 
Thank you for your gift of life through your son, Jesus Christ. You have loved us and known us since we were conceived. You know us so well and so deeply. Lord, you call us to peace, joy, kindness, love, and compassion for ourselves and for others. May we follow your will and reach out to others who are oppressed, hungry, in need of clothing, and in need of your love. Bless those who are broken and lonely, addicted and lost. Help us to help them find their way in you. Lord God, we pray for this nation and particularly for the refugees who have recently arrived in our community. May we reach out to them and provide, with, provide them with what they need to live a full life. Help us to discern what we should be doing. Be with those who have been victims of mass shootings and may their families find comfort and peace. We pray for peace in our world with the ending of wars and oppression and mass genocide. May we discern how we are to reach out and be the hands and feet of Christ. Show us the way to go and we will follow in your way. For it is in the name of the of of our son, your son Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. There are several ways in which we can respond this morning. Um, <clears throat> Connie mentioned, uh, and I'm sure that you've heard in, in the news about the refugee children that have come to, uh, to Erie. And um, you know, there, there is a way that we as a church can respond and should respond. Your lay leader and I have made some phone calls and to try to find out uh, what is needed, but we have been unsuccessful uh, in getting a, an appropriate answer to those questions. Um, however, um, I heard on the news that they are collecting uh, new clothes and uh, I believe toys and games for, uh, they're all girls and I can't remember what ages, I think they're all under 12, I think between 5 and 12. Um, and those are being collected, and there is a drop-off date, uh, I believe, next weekend and the following weekend at Erie First Assembly. Um, so you can uh, purchase those items and deliver them to Erie First Assembly, or if someone wants to coordinate a church-wide effort, um, if you feel called to do that, that might be one way in which you offer yourselves to the community. Um, please, please let... Uh, either myself or Lori know, and uh, um, we can help you out with that. If you want to coordinate that for the church, that would be wonderful. Now, we can collect the items here, and then one person can bring them to Erie First Assembly. You can also respond, as I mentioned, by um, 
prayerfully uh, thinking about how you are um, offering yourself to God by working with the community. Um, so fill those out and, and deposit them in the offering basket that is uh, at the entry exit to the um, worship space. Um, and if you, haven't, if you don't have time to do that today and you want to do that uh, throughout this week, uh, you can bring them any time during the week or bring them back next Sunday. And finally, of course, we offer um, our uh, resources to God, the resources that God has already given us through our tithes and our offerings that help to uh, make this church a community of faith and help us to make a difference in the world. And so you can do so in a number of ways. You can do so through our church app or through our church website. Or you can mail those offerings into the church office. And, of course, you can deposit them in the offering plate that is located at the entry exit to this worship space. Let us pray. O oh, glorious and gracious and ever-loving God, we thank you for all the gifts that you have given us all the gifts and abilities that you've given us to serve in your name and to respond to the needs both internally and externally that we find. And so we pray, O oh God, that you might uh, prompt us however you feel necessary and help us to align ourselves with your will. We pray your blessing upon all that we have to offer, whether it's ourselves or our financial resources, that we pray that you might bless them to do your work, to help build your kingdom, and to make you known. And so we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. I thank you for joining us for worship uh, this day, whether you were here in person or whether you were worshiping with us online. We are, I'm grateful that you are here and that we can be together as a community. I hope you'll join us next week, again, either worshiping online or uh, in person at 8.15 or 9.30. And um, next week we'll be talking about life in the spirit as a community. And now remember, we never leave a place of worship, but instead we are sent out into the world to be and do for others with Jesus Christ has been and done for us. Let us go and do so now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.